G'day everyone, my name's Matt and welcome back to The Fire Show. In this episode, we're going to continue talking about bushfire behaviour. But firstly, we're going to deal with a problem on the set, which is in fact that, which is a halligan tool, or what we call in my home state, a hooligan tool, even though it's actually named after Hugh Halligan, who's the person who invented it. Now, halligan tools are actually really good in the urban setting, where they're great for break and entries and those kinds of tasks but they're not particularly suited to bushfires. So what I did is I went online and bought something that's a little bit more related to bushfire fighting, which is this, which is a Pulaski. And you guessed it, it's actually named after the person who invented it, who was Ed Pulaski. So what we're gonna do is go ahead and replace the Halligan tool, or Hooligan tool, with the Pulaski. All right, much better. Okay, so in this episode, we're going to talk about the different types of fires, being ground fires, surface fires, and crown fires. And we're going to talk about the different types of fuel that actually feed these fires. And we're going to go ahead and start with ground fires. Now, ground fires are exactly as their name suggests. They are when the ground, or soil, catches on fire. Now, for this to happen, they need a fairly high level of organic material. And in a report that was recently completed by scientists from the University of Tasmania, they found that the soil needs to be comprised of at least 34% of organic material so that that soil layer will actually be flammable. They also found that it's actually the moisture content within that soil that is the most important factor to whether the soil will be flammable or not. Now ground fires pose a really interesting problem for fire managers because they can burn for months at a time underground. Now this means the fire can actually continue to burn underground until the fire weather actually gets worse again. And when the fire weather does get worse, the fire can pop up out of the ground and then take another run in some unburnt vegetation. Now this means that we actually need to get out and actually check all of these areas around the fire edge to ensure that the fire can't take another run as soon as the fire weather gets bad again. Now this means we either need to move in with earth moving equipment and dig these areas up, or, which is often the case in Tasmania, we actually need to put boots on the ground and send firefighters in with hand tools. Now this is because the area might be very isolated and too remote to actually get earth moving equipment in, or in the cases of national parks in the World Heritage Area, it's actually too sensitive to send earth moving equipment into these areas, and so we actually need to go in with hand tools and actually extinguish them that way. Now this can be very labour intensive and we actually need to send specialist crews known as remote area teams to actually extinguish these fires. And once we've dug them up, then we can actually apply water to them either using a hose lay or by using drops from a helicopter. So the next type of bushfire we're going to talk about is a surface fire. Now, surface fires are the most common types of fire, and it's generally how a fire will actually move across a landscape. They will intensify at times and turn into a crown fire, and they can also burn underground in a ground fire as we've already seen. But generally speaking, most bushfires are going to be a surface fire for the majority of the time. Now, surface fires actually occupy a whole range of different fuel types. And in a project by some Australian scientists known as Project Vesta, these different fuel layers have actually been identified. And by identifying and then measuring these different types of fuels, the scientists found that they could actually start to predict a fire's spread across a landscape with much greater accuracy than what was previously possible with older fuel models. So what we're going to do is have a very quick look at the different fuel layers that actually make up our surface fire. And we're going to start with the surface layer. Now the surface layer is exactly as it sounds, it's the fuel that is sitting on the surface of the ground. So it's generally laying down and it's generally made up of the leaves and bark and twigs and these kinds of things from the plants around. Now these surface fuels are actually really important because they actually generate a lot of the heat from the fire. And they also play a really important part to how deep the actual fire front will be because it's the surface fuels that actually provide the heat that is required to ignite the fuels that are in the layers above the surface layer. So the surface layer is actually a really important part of actually assessing a landscape. So our next layer is our near surface fuels. Now these are the grasses and small shrubs that make up the layer that is just above our surface layer. Now when our surface fire is burning, it can actually ignite these fuels. And what we can actually see is our flame length will actually dramatically increase, which then allows it to get into the next layer of fuels which is our elevated fuel layer. Now our elevated fuel layer is made up of our taller bushes and our smaller trees, and this layer actually works as ladder fuels for the canopy, because these fuels are actually placed right between our surface and our near surface fuels, and the canopy itself. So when the fire actually travels from our surface fire into our near surface and elevated fuels, 
and it actually has a path to then transition into our canopy, which then moves us on to our crown fires, which is our third type of fire. Now crown fires are actually when the canopy of the trees are combusted. Now these types of fires are much less common than our surface fires because it actually takes a lot of energy for our surface fire to ignite the crown fire. And so it's much less common to actually see a crown fire moving across a landscape than it is for a surface fire. Now if I just stop the video here, you can see that there are several sections of the canopy that are starting to catch a light. And if you have a look below them, you can see that the surface, near surface and elevated fuel layers are all on fire. And this just goes to show that if we have a continuous fuel layer from our surface layer right through to our canopy, then a crown fire can establish itself. Now this isn't necessarily the only way that a crown fire can establish itself, but by having this continuous fuel layer, it certainly makes it more likely that we're going to see a crown fire in that area. So the final fuel layer that we're gonna talk about today is the bark layer. Now the bark layer is a really important factor when we're talking about potential spotting behavior. Because as a fire runs up a tree and sets the bark on fire, and depending on the prevailing wind conditions, that bark can be cast a long way in front of the fire, where it can actually start new fires in the form of spot fires, and then allow the fire to spread even faster across the landscape. So one last factor that applies to all of these fuel layers is the amount of live versus dead material. Now this is really important, and we've talked about this in the previous video, because live material will respond differently to fire to how dead material will. And this is because of the amount of moisture that is actually available within the fuel to resist that fuel actually catching on fire. Now to demonstrate the effect of these different fuel layers, what we're gonna do is run a few little experiments where you can actually see our fire moving through our different fuel layers. Now first off, we're gonna start with our surface layer fuels. Now you can see here, we've got it on an angle so that our fire will actually move a little bit faster through our fuel bed. But what you can see is we've only got a fairly small flame height and the fire will actually move through there quite effectively but it doesn't move through with very long flame lengths. And this is because it only has the surface fuels to actually feed that fire. So next, what we're gonna do is add some near surface fuels. And what you can see is our surface fire is actually burning towards these near surface fuels. And then once the fire actually reaches these fuels, you can see that our flame length actually dramatically increases in length. And that's because the fire is burning through our surface fuels and then it sets our near surface fuels on fire. And this is a really clear demonstration of the effect of our near surface fuels in comparison to the surface fuels. By having that extra layer of fuels, what we actually see is our fire's intensity really increases quite quickly. So the next layer we're gonna demonstrate is our elevated fuels. So you can see our fire burning through our surface and near surface fuels, and you can see what happens when they actually set our elevated fuels on fire we actually see another really significant extension of that flame. And this really just demonstrates how a fire is gonna be moving through a landscape. It's going to come from our surface fuels and move into our near surface fuels. And then if there's elevated fuels there that are gonna carry it into the canopy, then those elevated fuels are going to combust and the fire is actually gonna be able to travel through to the next layer of fuels, which of course is our canopy fuels. And that's what we're gonna demonstrate next. Now you can see here, we've got our surface, near surface and elevated fuels and we've also added a canopy layer. And you can see how when the fire is burning through, it quickly transitions through the layers when the conditions are right. So we see our fire move from the surface and near surface layers, quickly transitioning into our elevated fuels, which work as ladder fuels, and then it moves into the canopy. You can see how our fire's intensity greatly increases as it moves through the different fuel layers. All right, so now we've seen that it's not just the amount of fuel that's available within a given area that is actually going to affect how our fire is going to burn, but it's also how that fuel is distributed across the different fuel layers and how much live versus dead material there is actually within that fuel load. So these different factors are really gonna affect how our fire is actually gonna travel across the landscape. And by knowing them, it's gonna help us actually start to predict what a fire is going to do. But that's it for this one. Thanks very much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. See ya.